Souls. You heal the sick and open blind Yet eyes we serve a God of miracles Demons flee the moment you arise Arise and show yourself strong Arise, arise and show yourself strong We serve, oh we serve a God of miracles You heal the sick and open blinded eyes We serve a God of miracles The demons flee the moment you Arise, arise, and show yourself strong. Arise, arise, and show yourself strong. We serve a God of power. We serve a God of power. Oh, we serve a God of mind. We serve a God of signs and wonders. We serve a God of power. Oh, we serve a God of mind. You speak and all creation thunders. We serve a God of miracles. You heal the sick and open blinded eyes. We serve a God of miracles. The demons flee the moment you arise, arise and show yourself strong. Arise. Serve a God of miracles. Always oh, serve a God of miracles. Hear the sick and open blind. And I will serve a God of miracles. The demons flee the moment you arise, arise. And show yourself strong. Arise, arise. Show. Serve a God of power. Oh, we serve a God of power. We serve a God of mind. We serve a God of signs and wonders. We serve a God of power. Oh, we serve a God of mind. You speak and all creation thunders. We serve a God of miracles. Heal the sick and open blind And I we serve a God of miracles Demons flee the moment you arise Arise and show yourself strong Arise, arise and show yourself strong Amen, Lord you are good Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Oh, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Sing a hallelujah. Hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. Oh, Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. People from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you, singing hallelujah, hallelujah, we worship you for who you are, oh, and we worship you, singing hallelujah, Hallelujah, we worship you for who you are. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet tonight. Sing that song, Nothing But the Blood. What can wash away 
my sin Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other sounds I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus For oh, my part in this I see Nothing but the blood of Jesus For oh, my cleansing this my plea Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood. Oh, precious. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fountain I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. We're going to slow it down this evening as we enter into an atmosphere of worship. Worthy is the Lamb. <clears throat> Worthy is a lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is he. Sing a new song to him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Worthy is a lamb. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. And sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Lift your hands and I sing, Holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty Who was and is and is to come To all creation I sing Praise to the King of Kings You are my everything And I will adore you Clothed in rainbows, clothed in rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder, blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy and holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. And I will adore you, filled with wonder, filled with wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath, and living water. Such a marvelous misery is the whole. Oh, lift your hands tonight. He is holy, is the Lord God Almighty, 
who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything and I will sing holy and holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come? With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything. I will adore you. Christ is my reward. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. And now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy. And through every trial, my soul will sing, no turning back. I've been set free. Lift your hands and sing, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Everything I need is in you. Everything I need, Christ my all in all. And Christ my all in all. My joy and my salvation. And his hope will never fail. Heaven is our home. Through every storm, my soul will sing. Jesus is here. To God be the glory. Christ is enough, and Christ is enough for me. Decided. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the cross before
and everything I need. Ooh, let's give him praise tonight. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Oh, Shabbat Barras, sing your trouble, bobo, Oh, Father God, we give you praise. We give you glory, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, Father God, we praise you, Lord Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Amen. Uh, praise God. We serve a mighty God here in this place tonight. Amen. We would like to open our service tonight as we go before God in prayer, believing for him to move upon um, our service and in your life um, tonight. Amen. We have a few prayer requests we would like to lift up. We want to pray for Kenny. Uh, and Tanea and Jeffrey, they are sick, so they need God's healing upon their lives. Also, lifting up Sierra uh, for healing as well. We want to pray for Brady and Jose for salvation. Also, lifting up Tyler and Nick for salvation and praying for God to touch Craig and heal his life as well. Amen. We also want to pray for the leaders in our fellowship, praying for Pastor Greg and Lisa Mitchell in Prescott, Arizona, lifting up Pastor Foley in, McMin in McMinnville, Oregon, and praying for our pastor and Miss Jackie and all that God is doing in our city. We also want to pray for Pastor John and Sophie Foley in Massachusetts, lifting up Pastor Brian and Aisha Castillo in Belo Horizonte, Brazil, and lifting up Pastor Andy and Chris Altringer in Salem, Oregon. Uh, maybe you're here tonight and you have a prayer request as well and you want to believe God with an upraised hand. Let's bring our prayers before God in faith and, and when we subside, Chris King, if you could open our service this evening. Father God, we come to you tonight, Lord Jesus, believing for you to pour out your spirit and move, Lord, upon the Holy Ghost. God, we cry out to you, uh, Lord, by the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, heal these that are sick. Uh, Lord, touch all that are unsaved uh, with your salvation. God, move by the Holy Ghost. Uh, release your power here tonight. Let's give him praise and thank God tonight. Hallelujah. Father, we love you, Lord. Let's praise him, church. He's worthy to be praised. We thank you, Lord. God, we worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God bless you, Tanae. Oh, we all okay? Amen. God bless you tonight. We can go ahead and greet one another. Let somebody know you're glad to see them this evening. piano go ahead Second and third string drummers here tonight. 
Amen. I'm the third string if you wanted to know. Hallelujah. Vince is, uh, Vince is our second. It's pretty good when you got a 16-year-old that can play drums better than both 40-year-olds. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I'm just glad to see that Vince still got it. Amen. It's good to be saved tonight here in the house of God. God's here. God's going to help us. This evening, well, I'm preaching on the devil, so maybe that's why some folks are battling it to church tonight. Amen. Hopefully they're watching somewhere and they can hear God speak to them. We're, uh, we welcome you this evening. We have a few announcements we want to give to you uh, just briefly before we get into the Word of God tonight. A couple of things up and coming. First of all is uh, Friday night will be our youth crew here in the building. That's at 7 o'clock. So uh, young people, take notice of that. Parents. Uh, ages middle through uh, middle school through high school. Then uh, this Saturday we'll have our outreach, uh, men's class, at, uh, men's prayer, and the Bible study at seven. And then our outreach at eleven a.m. as we go out into our city and take the gospel outside the four walls. Sunday all day for the Lord. We'll have uh, children's church in the evening, uh, Sunday evening service. So parents. As well, take notice of that. And uh, then also uh, this uh, Monday, we have a, uh, this coming Monday on the 6th, uh, we have a men's discipleship class. That's with Pastor Jeff Day. He's going to be preaching in McVinville. So, uh, men, if you'll take notice of that, and uh, uh, we would, uh, I'd love to take as many of you as uh, possibly can. We have a van, and we also can make room in other vehicles as well. So uh, Monday the 6th, February the 6th, that's with Pastor Jeff Day. Always a tremendous time. Last two years that he's come in a row has been such a, a phenomenal uh, ministry. And uh, God has really helped us. Then on the 11th, we have an outreach team at Impact into Aloha. Oregon, so uh, uh, there's a sign-up sheet there for that if you uh, have the ability to go and help us. I also do want to put a plug. Pastor Joe Heaps asked if we could bring a team next Tuesday. So uh, we're trying to kind of generate them, get them uh, jump-started back into the new year. And uh, he said, Pastor, I, I need some new people, I need some new souls to uh, disciple and train. And I said, absolutely. So uh, we're going to go and help them. So if you're available Tuesday, we're going to go and help them for an hour or two over in Hazeldale in the evening. We'll meet over there. I'll give you the times on Sunday. I believe that'll be, we'll meet over there around 6, 6.30, something like that uh, on a Tuesday night. So if you can, come and help us for that as we uh, want to take care of our baby church uh, and help them make it, help them uh, see impact in the Hazeldale area for Jesus. We know God's on the throne tonight. Yeah. He's here to uh, help us. Marriage retreat on the 17th and 18th. Take notice of that. And uh, then uh, there is another outreach on the Saturday, the 25th, over to Hazeldale as well. I mentioned also uh, we are having revival. The uh, What is that? The third or fourth week, I'm sorry. Thir third week of March with uh, evangelist Donnell Butler from uh, Ogden, Utah is going to be with us. So that will always, uh, always is a great time. He came last year and uh, did such a tremendous job, had such a great uh, ministry. Also, I think you'll be excited to hear that uh, I've scheduled Pastor Julio Blanco to come and preach for us in May. So uh, uh, actually, I said that wrong. June, actually. I'm sorry. Uh, June. And... Uh, you still be excited. It's okay. Amen. We have conference in May, so that'll be good. Two, two good things in a row. Amen. So April, we're uh, uh, taking a team to Brazil. Uh, May, we'll have our uh, conference. And then uh, in June, we'll have revival with uh, Brother Julio Blanco. So we've got some great things lined up this year. God's uh, already uh, 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 moving. Pastor uh, Mitchell, we've referred to it, Pastor Greg Mitchell preached on the hastening about a coming revival this year and a quickening of revival in our churches. Uh, already since the conference, I've heard of two churches. One was the Sunday after that conference. Another one was uh, just last week, I believe, of uh, churches that had out of the blue uh, over 20 plus visitors in one service. 
And uh, God's doing something. Something's been released. Again, it, it wasn't just one church, but I know of at least two. Pastor K, uh, Casey Mammon in Peoria, uh, Phoenix, Arizona area. And then one of our churches in California. Uh, neither of these are very large churches. I think the, they're both probably around uh, 50 to 75 people. And so you can just imagine what 25 visitors in one service looks like. God is doing something, amen, and he, what he's doing is he's bringing the revival that he has foretold in his word, and you and I get to be a part of that, so excited to see all that God's going to do through that. I want to receive the offering of the evening, and we want to have our ushers come. Can we just give God thanks as the ushers come tonight? Let's honor the King of Kings, hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, God. We love you, Jesus. We worship you. Hallelujah. I was explaining to someone recently about uh, how things work in the stock market. There's a lot of different factors uh, that make the stock market go up and down. But one of them is whenever the, um, <clears throat> the Federal Reserve Bank, which controls the interest rates of our country, uh, some of you, you know, you're too young or you don't uh, maybe know enough to care, but you should care because it affects every time you take out a loan, your federal uh, interest rate, that's a benchmark for the interest rates that you will receive. And so they, what they've been doing is they've been last year, they've been raising the Federal Reserve interest rate every uh, so many months. And uh, what they're trying to do is slow the economy down and slow the inflation down. But it's a bit of a risky game because if you, uh, uh, if you do it too much, if they do it too much, investors will get cold feet and our stock market can uh, not only uh, kind of dry up, but it can stop. And we could actually, technically, we could have a stock market crash. And if you uh, want to know what that's like, just take a time machine back to 1929 when people were in soup lines uh, uh, for years, uh, very very bad uh, results from that. So they're trying to uh, find somewhere in the middle. And uh, someone was t asking me, why is it that, you know, some days the stocks will just take this huge hits and some days are going good. And so one of the, one of the uh, uh, reasons is because when these Federal Reserve make a statement about what they intend to do, that has a ripple effect and it touches all the investors. So uh, you may not care much about all that, and I understand that and I realize that. But in the kingdom of God, the world doesn't set the tone. God sets the tone. Aren't you glad that we're not contingent on our president's wisdom or advice or financial help or even our government? But at the end of the day, that we as believers, we function in God's economy. Can you say Amen. And there's something uh, to be said for that, uh, that we don't trust in riches. Our scripture says, commandos that are rich in this present age, not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come. that They may lay hold uh, on eternal life. And if you don't think that you're rich in this present age, you and I living in the good old United States of America, uh, comparatively, if you look at the wages, uh, I think they told me it was around, uh, 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 what was that, uh, 1,500, 2,000 hay ice a month uh, is what uh, the average Brazilian lives on. And if you want to know how much money that is in the United States dollars, you just divide it by five. So that would be about $400 U.S. for the whole month. That's their rent. That's their gas money. Uh, and what's, what's, what's really sad over there is, is the gas, the fuel is not proportionate. So to drive a car down there costs probably about four to five times proportionately what we pay because gas is actually more expensive in Brazil than it is here. Could you imagine making one-fifth of your wage and yet when you went to buy gas it was more expensive than it is here? Right? We're talking about a major expense. Uh, and yet the issue is, uh, is that we trust in God and we trust in God's economy, Amen. right? Command those that are rich in this present age. And uh, I know that not all of us are just necessarily, quote, unquote, rolling in the dough. But you know what? We're rich. We're blessed tonight. We're saved. 
we're here, we're in the house of God, and God has blessed us and seen fit to save us from hell and to put his stamp of the Holy Spirit on us. And as we come together, let's honor the King of Kings. Let's not trust in uncertain riches because those things go up and down. Let's trust in the living God who ultimately is our provider. He sets the tone for the God's economy. Let's honor him. Reuben, would you pray a blessing on Gift and Giver tonight? Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come into your courts and honor you with our heart. I pray that you would give us a cheerful heart as we give our tithes and our offerings to you. That's that you would move and bless the tithe and offerings and besides many times over as you see fit in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give this evening. Lord, you are good. Help us sing. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. And people, people from every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we worship you. Singing hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, musicians, for your ministry tonight. We really appreciate your uh, service and ministry. If you have your Bibles, 1 John, if you turn with me to 1 John and chapter 3, I believe God, have a word from God this evening, and I believe God will help us. How many came to hear from God tonight? I want to preach a message called, Which Lion Do You Want? In March of 1898, the British uh, were in Kenya and Uganda and uh, much, uh, many parts of Africa, uh, the continent of Africa, but they were constructing a railway that linked Uganda with the Indian Ocean at Kilindini Harbor. And in March of 1898, the British started building a railway bridge over the Savo River in Kenya. The building site consisted of several camps spread out over an area of eight miles, accommodating several thousand, mostly Indian workers. And the project was led by Lieutenant Colonel John Henry Patterson. The reason why we're talking about March 1898 and the British and uh, the uh, project in Savo is because during the next nine months of construction, two Male Savo lions, you can put this picture up. <clears throat> and uh, then you can go to the next one. It's dead in that picture, but they've got its mouth propped up. <clears throat> they begin to attack the campsite, dragging workers from their tents at night, devouring them. There was an interval of several months when the attack ceased, Word trickled in from other nearby settlements of similar lion attacks. When lions returned, the attacks intensified with almost daily killings. There's different estimates. One estimate says uh, 35 people were killed during this time of nine months. Another estimate says 140 people were killed. Crews tried to scare off the lions and built campfires and uh, thorn fences made of whistling thorn trees around their camp for protection to keep the man-eaters, they call them the man-eating lions, the man-eaters out, all to no avail. The lions just leaped over or crawled through the thorn fences. Patterson noticed early in their killing spree only one lion at a time would enter the inhabited areas and seize the victims, but later they became more bold, entering together and each seizing a victim each night. As the attacks mounted, hundreds of workers fled from Savo, halting construction on the bridge 
At this point, colonial officials begin to intervene. According to Patterson, even the district officer, Mr. Whitehead, nearly escaped being killed by one of the lions after arriving at the Savo train depot in the evening. However, his assistant, Abdullah, was killed while Whitehead escaped with four claw lacerations running down his back. <clears throat> I want to talk about a lion. I actually want to talk about two lions mentioned in the Bible, and you're probably familiar with them, but I want to speak to them this evening. And a sermon really about the devil. I've never really, I don't know that I've ever preached an entire sermon about the devil. The Bible says, the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You ever seen lions at the zoo? You know, they look great in pictures. They're very majestic. They're very... Uh, some lions are very beautiful. But I'll tell you, when you get up close to them, you realize this is a wild animal. Even the ones that have been uh, 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 captured and uh, kept in captivity, uh, they're known. You, they, you have to be very careful in lion's cages, even if they've been in captivity for years, because sometimes they'll go rogue and they'll turn on their uh, uh, caretakers. And I want to preach about uh, lions, a sermon that I've entitled, Which Lion Do You Want or Which Lion Do You Follow? Out of 1 John chapter 3, and uh, let's read verses 4 through uh, 11. 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 11. Y'all there with me in your Bibles? It says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he, that's talking about Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he, Jesus, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the Beginning For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Verse 11, for this is the message that you've heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And I'm going to stop right there. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Holy Ghost and your word. I'm asking you to open our hearts that we might hear from you. Speak to us, God. Bring us, uh, God, revelation about our enemy and our uh, opposition, but also give us revelation about your power and your love uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, and in Jesus' name and all God's people said... Uh, Amen. Which lion do you want? Um, let's talk about, first of all, the devil. Who exactly is the devil? And I think this is good for us to, to visit. I mean, you know, people have a lot of different ideas about the devil. Some people believe he's just make-believe. Other people believe that, uh, you know, he's just kind of this uh, dark ooze matter that just kind of flows around and every once in a while he uh, makes you lose your socks or slashes your tires or something but a devil the Bible tells us uh, uh, quite a bit of information about him and I'm not going to visit all this but I just want to touch on some of the highlights but it's important first of all to realize the devil is one of God's angels you ever heard people say this phrase? Maybe they're talking about, you know, uh, somebody else, a, a little kid or something, and they'll say, they're such an angel. Or, you know, I've heard people say, you know, uh, you know uh, they, they went to heaven so they could be one of God's angels, you know. Here's something interesting about the devil. Lucifer, or Satan, as he's also called, is he started his existence as an angel, Created by God and in the presence of God. Ezekiel 28, uh, many scholars believe this refers to the devil. It actually uh, specifically says the king of Tyre. But the reason why we believe it refers to the devil is because of the words itself. Ezekiel 20, uh, 28, 14, and 15, you were the anointed cherub who covers. 
I establish you. This is God talking to what I believe to be the devil. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. There was a time before man's creation when Satan was in heaven and he was without sin. Now, I'm not going to belabor this point, but many believe that he was maybe like the equivalent of like the worship leader in heaven. And that's taken, again, out of that text in Ezekiel 28. You can read it later and come to your own conclusions. So, but we do know that he had power. He had position. He had beauty. He had influence. Uh, he had all these things. Uh, he had a, a relationship with God. He was in the presence of God. He was uh, uh, probably someone that per perhaps even today, if we were to see him in the physical, we may even be tempted to be drawn to him or even worship him because the Bible says he can present himself as an angel of light. But then he chose to sin and he rebelled against God. Isn't that right? Never, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the original sinner wasn't Adam or Eve. It was actually the devil. Verse 8, it actually says this. It says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. He was the original sinner. He sinned before any other human being. And what was his sin at the beginning? I think it's good to visit that momentarily. We know that according to Isaiah 14, and the statements that he made, which I'm going to read in a moment, had to do with pride. I mean, no, pride can cause a lot of problems. You ever met a very prideful person? And if you haven't met any, um, well, maybe it's you. And uh, maybe you're the one that uh, everybody else met. Uh, verse 12, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I mean, no, that's probably not going to happen. Hello. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Whoa, 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 whoa. Taking you off Twitter, buddy. You're getting canceled right now. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, the lowest depths of the pit. He rebelled against God and God had to judge him. No longer could he have his position and his authority and his place in heaven, but he had to be removed from heaven. You all with me here tonight? Because of his influence, the Bible says he drew a third of the angels of heaven with him as well because rebels usually want to take others down with them. It's a characteristic. But it begs the question then, why does it matter? Is it really that important, secondly, to know about the devil? Okay, Some people don't see the value of knowing or having knowledge about the devil. Can't we just be satisfied that we don't see the ugly creature and uh, put all of our focus on God instead? And the answer is we do need to put our focus on God because God is far more important uh, person to know about. But the reality is, too, our devil, the devil is our enemy. We need to realize he's a formidable foe, one that should be reckoned with and to be ignorant of such a powerful opponent is a mistake that has cost many casualties. Why is it important to know about the devil? Here's number one, because he's the sworn enemy of God. Satan hates God, and because God allows him to live, he actively resists anything and everything that God values and that God tries to do. Okay, think about this for a moment. Uh, because Satan uh, hates also God's image bearers. I mean, oh, you and I are the image bearers of God. Satan hates you. Some people think that Satan only hates Christians or believers. That's actually not true. Satan hates all of humanity. Why? Because every time he looks at a human, he sees a reflection, at least to, look to some degree or another, of God himself. 
And he despises every human being. He's chosen to target humanity in an effort to take out his hatred against God. I was reading a little bit about lions. Lions in the wild can be pretty fearsome creatures. An adult African male lion can weigh up to 550 pounds. It's a little bit bigger probably than your dog at home. They can grow to be 10 feet long and have a bite force of up to 10,000 pounds per square inch. Sometimes their teeth get up to four inches long. Can you imagine a creature that has a, a jaw strength of 10,000 or 1,000 PSI with four inch long teeth biting into you? It's probably going to leave a mark or a couple. But think about that because Satan is a sworn enemy of God. Therefore, he is a sworn enemy of ours. Peter says the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You may be tempted to think, well, you know, I'm not really that important in the kingdom of God. I mean, I really don't think the devil would mess with me. It seems like people go to one of two extremes in the area of the devil. Some people think that the devil's, you know, doing everything. You know, he made my car run out of gas, you know. Well... Maybe he just uh, made your neighbor siphon your gas. Amen. <laughs> but, uh, but then the other extreme is that we don't give him any credence or any uh, of his rightful place. Uh, and we fail to realize that we have a roaring lion who's seeking to devour us. They say these two lions killed somewhere between 35 and 140 people. The 35 quote comes from modern numbers. The, the, 100, the 140 uh, number came from what people, kind of tradition, and from people that lived in that time period said that's how many people had died. So we don't know the exact number, but can you imagine the terror on that village and on that, those, those camps where they were working? People were freaked out. They were afraid. Eventually, they started leaving in such numbers that the uh, leader, this guy, Mr. Patterson, had to uh, uh, take care of it himself. And I'm going to talk about what he did here in a moment. But how does Satan influence and destroy? Because secondly, we need to care about the devil because he has power to influence and destroy. How does he do that? Well, I think there's a few ways. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I'm talking about a couple of them. Here's, here's one of the ways Satan influences and destroys mankind is through fiery darts against the mind. You know, the name of Satan, uh, Lucifer, means accuser of the brethren. And he attacks the minds of mankind in many different ways. I, uh, this is very sad. I, we were praying for an individual in our fellowship who recently, I didn't know this could happen, he, got, he contracted mad cow disease. You know what mad cow disease is? It's a virus that uh, can get inside a cow's brains, and it'll literally drive them crazy. And uh, apparently this guy got this. He died. He passed away recently. And I was thinking, what a, what a horrible way to go. But I wonder if Satan can fire little virus darts in our minds, and, and spiritually we can have mad cow disease and not even realize it. You ever been talking to somebody that weren't on drugs, they weren't crazy in the sense, uh, they, weren't, they weren't, you know, like uh, medical necessarily, but they weren't making rational decisions and choices. You tried to reason with them and explain, listen, listen, you can't do that. But then they just, because of their emotional mindset or their uh, thought process or thought patterns, uh, the Bible talks about how the enemy presents himself as an angel of light. You know, he can present things that seem reasonable, that seem right. It's interesting. I, I'm not going to go deep into this because there's a lot here, but I was reading about the Big Bang Theory. And uh, one of the greatest proponents, Christopher Dawkins, uses circular reasoning to support his belief in the Big Bang and uh, a theory. And again, I'm not going to go into all this. I was reading about this today, and it's written by a Christian author, but he explains how this particular scientist, and he's not the only one. He didn't come up with the Big Bang Theory, but he supports it. And uh, it talked about how his, basically his argument for the Big Bang was that the fact that we are here shows that 
even though all these things combined that took to, to get us here by accident is kind of a pretty big improbability. It must be true, though, because we're here. That's essentially, I'm simplifying, but that's essentially his argument. I'm sorry, but that's not a scientific argument. This is Christopher Dawkins. This guy's famous. He's written books. He's, and I'm not saying he's not intelligent. These are intelligent people. But your reasoning kind of breaks down here, Bubba. We're, we're, uh, we're, not, we're not really tracking with you. Because you exist, that's evidence for the Big Bang? No, I don't think so. You might be forgetting that there's another option of how you could have got here, and that could have been through an intelligent creator called God, Jehovah God, the God of the Bible. Maybe, just maybe, all this isn't just some incredibly miraculous random Yahtzee chance. How could you, how could you randomly develop an eyeball of a human being to have, what is it, 900 megapixels in it? You know, we have to work really hard to get, what, 10, 12 megapixels? Maybe now it's 30 megapixels on a camera, on a phone. That takes a lot of effort and planning and careful thought. You would never suggest that you would just take all the materials for that and put it in a lab room and just, you know, turn on a button that just spins it around for 10 billion years and magically, eventually, that's going to make a, an iPhone that has, uh, you know, 900 megapixels on it. A lot of evidence for design. You young people, I hope you're paying attention to me because you're going to hear a lot more of this uh, talk about evolution. They're going to present this as a viable explanation for how our world came to be. But if you start looking at their arguments, it really starts breaking down. There's no evidence for what we call uh, macroevolution and the Big Bang Theory, etc. But you see what I'm saying? See, the enemy, he presents himself as an angel of light. Ooh, Google said it. Should you really trust everything you read on Google or everything that Siri tells you? But that's what we do. That's what people are doing. Satan supplies all manner of twisted lies and plots and schemes and ideas. I wonder if there are things that we believe right now, here, you and I, if there may be things in our mind that didn't originate from God, but may have originated from a, a lion named Satan. If you were Satan and you had thousands of years to wage war, wouldn't you try to find a way to plant lies into the minds of as many people as you possibly could? I think all of us would agree that uh, cannibalism is wrong. <clears throat> mm. all, every part of that's just wrong. Taste, you know, smell, all the above, right? But there are groups that we found around the world where it's a practice. It's something they practice. Where did that idea come from? That it was okay to kill another person and take their life and then proceed past that? That didn't come from God, beloved. Now, I'm just using that as kind of a simple example. But you see, a lot of the things that, that we think, a lot of the ways that we perceive and the way that we view people even, our text says, if you don't love your brother, you're not of God. And some of you are like, yeah, well, my, it's my sister I can't stand. <laughs> okay. Your brethren, right? Your brothers and sisters in Christ. Yeah. Well, I just, I just can't get along with them. It's not really optional. You have to love them. You have to get over yourself and start loving them. Oh, back to nice pastor. Okay. Do you think Satan tells lies about God's love and about people? 2 Corinthians 2.11, Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. But the problem is many times we actually are ignorant of his devices. We don't realize that he's woven his lies, he's woven his tapestry into our mind. And now that has to be 
taken apart by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit, by the preaching of the Word of God, and by our own will and us beginning to identify, you know what, that thought is not of God. That is a lie. And I have to judge that, and I have to discern that. Here's another way that he exerts influence and destruction is through spiritual oppression. Do you think Satan is constantly looking for access points, footholds, weak areas in our defenses? I was talking with someone a few days ago, and he uh, is an amateur uh, uh, rock climber, mountain climber. And I was really curious. I was really fascinated to hear about rock climbing. I've never done any uh, actual rock climbing other than, you know, like maybe the thing at the community center. Uh, but actual rock climbing with all the right, you know, ropes and, and pitons and all those things. Uh, and he was explaining it to me. And I, was, I was quite fascinated by it. One of the keys to at least how he uh, uh, does his rock climbing is you have these clamps, they call them pitons, if I'm saying that correctly, and the end of it's like a wedge. And so what you do is as you're going up, you find cracks or crevices in the rock, and there has to be a hole big enough for you to uh, stick this clamp in there. And uh, when you, uh, I'm not sure if you turn it or uh, if you uh, smack it, somehow it'll actually wedge itself into that, and you can actually gain a, a foothold or a handhold to be able to tie a rope to, and then you can actually, literally, you can climb almost almost sheer cliffs. You can climb. He said sometimes he's climbed cliffs that were shaped, that were inverted, where you're actually literally going back like this, uh, and uh, there's ways to climb those. Uh, how many know Satan is looking for those little footholds, those little, just a little crack, a little crevice where he can put in his little piton and set some dominion right there? Bondage. Darkness. He gains access through sin. That's why it says in verse 8, He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. See, sin brings us under the control and under the influence. You know, there's certain things when you're driving that you, you're not allowed legally to be under the influence of. Uh, marijuana is one of them. Please don't smoke, but especially please don't smoke and drive. Alcohol, right? There's a certain amount of alcohol because otherwise you'd be under the influence. I wonder if there's believers that are, they believe in Jesus, they go to church, they pray, but still parts, portions of their life are under the influence. Are you with me here, beloved? Satan gains access through emotions, through circumstances, through thought patterns and strongholds, through attitudes and decisions, through lifestyle choices and behaviors that violate God's truths. As revealed in the Bible, Satan often uses discouragement and discontentment to move humanity further from God. But there is some good news here tonight, and that's what I want to focus on this evening. If you're starting to get a little worried or discouraged, amen, let's talk about uh, the plan because the reality is we need to be informed about the devil from the Bible so that way we can overcome him. A devil exposed is a devil defeated. Eventually, back to these two lions. Go ahead and, Anna, can you put those up? Uh, yeah, the other one, would you? <clears throat> The other officials arrived with reinforcement and about 20 armed men to assist in the hunt. So Colonel Patterson set traps and tried several times to ambush the lions at night from a tree. After repeated unsuccessful attempts, he shot the first lion on December 9, 1898. Keep in mind, this started in March of that same year. 20 days later, the second lion was found and killed. The first lion measured 9 feet 8 inches from nose to tip of tail. It took eight men to carry the carcass back to camp. It's a very large animal. Patterson wrote his account. He wounded the first lion. It talks about how he shot it and a bunch of different details, like hunter stories. If you know anything about hunter stories, you know they kind of get bigger with time and, and stuff. But he, he did shoot it. The second one, they had to shoot it with three different rifles, three different times. He said when he found the lion the next day, this is after it had already been shot and hit several times, uh, they found the lion the next day. Patterson shot it three more times with the same rifle, severely crippling it, and he shot it three times with a third rifle, twice in the chest and once in the head, which finally killed it. He claimed it died gnawing on a fallen tree branch, still trying to reach him. 
These things are like monsters. But how many know the devil can be defeated? I want to look thirdly at how can we defeat him because that's really where this message is bringing us to. How do we defeat the devil? Here's number one. Somebody say number one. We got to get to Jesus because Jesus defeated Satan at the cross. How many know the devil's not the only lion around? The Bible in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, refers to Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Which lion do you want to protect you? Sin brings us back to the devil, but when we surrender, we repent of sin, and we get things right with Jesus, now we come under the protection of the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus won the victory against Satan at the cross and at the tomb. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we can have victory over Satan. Our scripture, the other part of verse 8 says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. How many know we have power through the blood of Jesus Christ? For the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of our sins, there's repentance and faith in His blood can override the power and the weight of the guilt of our sin. Isaiah 53, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment for our peace was put upon Him, and by His stripes we are healed. Let me tell you something. Religion can't save you. Going to church can't save you. Being a good person doesn't save you. You know, hell is filled. Someone said, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Oh, I'm going to be a good person. I just wonder how many people have gone to hell and said, how could I be here? How could I go here? I was a good person. And then the devil shows up and says, oh, you were, were you? Did you ever sin? Yes. Did you ever repent and put your faith in his blood? You say, well, you know, you're just trying to scare us, uh, and uh, you're just trying to put fear tactics on us, uh, so that way we'll repent and get it right. Well, I don't know about you. Hell is a pretty fearful place. Hello? Hello? If we could spend three minutes in hell, it would probably cure us of a lot of our sin, beloved. <laughs> I don't think any one of us wants to go there. I've had people tell me, well, I don't believe in hell. Hmm, that's an interesting argument. Do you use that with gravity when you jump off a 10-story building? I don't believe in gravity. <laughs> See? No. Regardless of what you believe, there are some things that are true regardless of whether you believe them or not. So what are you going to believe? What are you going to put your faith in? What are you going to anchor your life to? What are you connecting yourself to? Because Jesus has defeated Satan at the cross. And ultimately in Revelation 21... The Bible says uh, he's going to defeat him at the end of the age for once and for all and forcibly take him and uh, bind him up in hell, throw him in the lake of fire where he's going to be with all the others, with all those that have rejected Jesus and the grace of God. And we're not going to have to deal with the devil anymore. <clears throat> Best way to defeat him, number one, is to submit your life and surrender your life to Jesus. Uh, grow in love. Here's number two. Grow in love and submission to the Lord Jesus. You know what happens when you submit to Jesus? The Bible says, submitting to God, then resist the devil, and he will flee from you. <clears throat> it's as if Jesus becomes your personal sheriff. When you give your life to Jesus, there's a new sheriff in town. And let me tell you something about devil. He's a lion, but he's intimidated by Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is not an angel, he's God. He's not a created being. Jesus has always existed. We refer to him as the Son of God. That's what the Bible says. 
He's the second person of the triune God, the Trinity, as revealed in the Bible all throughout Scripture. And he has all authority over the, over the devil and over Satan. And when he tells Satan what to do, he has to obey. <clears throat> it's the preaching of the Word of God. It's able to pierce through the lies of hell that are launched at our minds. <clears throat> Revelations 12, verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Can you imagine this guy? He had to shoot this second line. They shot it something like nine times. Hit it seven or eight out of nine times. He said the very last time he shot, the lion was still with his teeth grabbing onto a brunch, trying to get to him to bite onto him. But how rewarding did that feel? I got heavier firepower here, buddy. <clears throat> Let me tell you something about Jesus. He's got heavier firepower than the devil. Jesus, Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether you will serve the gods on this side of the Jordan River or whether you will serve the living God, the God Jehovah, you choose. But as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Young people. And maybe not young people. You have to decide whom you're going to serve. Which lion is going to be your protector? Which lion are you going to be obedient to? Because one lion's going to be in heaven for all of eternity and the other one's not. The choice is yours tonight. We need to <clears throat> talk about strongholds in our mind. The Bible says, casting down strongholds, beloved, bringing every thought captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Do you think sometimes there's thoughts that have been implanted in our mind that are actively resisting God? Yeah. Oh, you know, I can't go to that church because they're all so perfect. we got some great people here, but ha have you talked to any of us very much? Have you gotten to know us? Last time I checked by Bible's definition, there's none that are righteous. No, not one. Well, I can't go to church because they're all filled with hypocrites. That's the other extreme. Well, it's okay. You'll, you'll fit right in, I'm sure. You know, somebody told me, I don't go to church because there's hypocrites at church. And I said, well... I have a question. Are there hypocrites at work? Yeah. And do you still go to work? Uh, yeah. See how the devil can sow all these kind of seeds that seem to make so much sense until we say them out loud? I've had people sit down with them and they'll say, Pastor, I've got to tell you something. It's going to blow your mind. I, I, it's, it's probably going to shock you, and you're not going to know what to do, and I don't know what to do, and, and it's just crazy. And, and, and so I just sit there politely and wait, because eventually they'll get around to saying it, and then they say it. It's whatever it is. It's like, okay. Is that all of it? Yeah, I don't know what you're going to do, Pastor. Now that you said it, it sounds a little different when you say it out loud, isn't it? See, a lot of times these things just tumble in our head, and they seem to make so much sense. But then when we talk out loud to someone of mature faith, sometimes God can begin to show us that was a lie. Yeah. Pastor, I'm pretty sure you hate me. <laughs> mm, nah. Devil, yes. If your name's Lucifer, then yes. Amen. But the other humans, no. Well, you didn't shake my hand the other night, and I saw the way you looked at so and so, and then you were telling them to get that, and then you boom, and that, and you made this thing, and then you made that one little movement with your eyes and the eyebrows, and I, I, you hate me, don't you? <laughs> no, I, I just had an eyebrow out of line, so I was trying to get it back in line. I don't hate you. And it's, it's silly when we say it out loud, but isn't that how we think sometimes? Can, can I preach here tonight? Oh, yeah, pal. Oh, yeah, God's mad at me. Uh, maybe God's not mad at you. Maybe, you know, you just accidentally locked your keys in the house. 
That's okay. You'll get through it. We'll help you cut a hole in your door and get through. Amen. Y'all with me here tonight? How many lies has the devil been sowing? Has the lion been planting? Maybe for years in our minds. And I understand that not, maybe not all of them are going to get exposed tonight. But as you begin to analyze your thought life and the strongholds and the habits and things, you need to begin to, you can actually ask God and say, you know what, God, is that right that I think that way? Is that right? You, you know what racism is? Lies. Lies about people. Once you get, once you understand the love of Jesus, you won't have an issue with racism. Now, you might have to process. Even Peter in the Bible had some lies about other nationalities that he had to process. He thought the Jews were superior to Gentiles. God had to straighten him out. But apparently God must have done a pretty good job because when he went to Cornelius' household and preached, they got saved and they got filled with the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? And God touched them and he came back and he testified to the Jews. He said, guys, I've got the craziest testimony. God gave me this vision about Cornelius' house and I went down there and I preached Jesus and non-Jews got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and started speaking in tongues. Therefore, I perceive that God has given this gift to the Gentiles also. you got to understand, for Peter, living his whole life, you don't even talk to non-Jews. Maybe you have an issue with racism. Maybe you have an issue with prejudice. Maybe you have an issue, right? These are things in our mind and in our heart that God wants to help expose and help us so that we can be renewed in the spirit of our mind. We don't keep living and functioning and thinking in those same old ways. But God can help us and set us free. Finally, is to connect to the church of Jesus. Jackie, my wife, has been reading <clears throat> a couple of books recently. One of them is about a missionary named Betty Green. She lived in the... Uh, during World War II, she actually uh, became what's uh, known as a WASP, uh, a women's uh, segment uh, female aviator in World War II. So she, uh, they had a, um, a detachment of uh, female uh, pilots in World War II, and she was one of those. This was uh, kind of a new uh, thing for uh, the Air Force, etc. But after World War II was over, she was a Christian. She wanted to contribute to missionary endeavors. So starting in the 1940s, she helped start a ministry called Mission Aviation Fellowship. And their goal was to fly missionaries in and out of countries around the world as well as maintain contact. This was to help missionaries in places that weren't easily... Um, approachable, first of all in Central and South America and then actually other countries all around the world. But she was their first pilot. Jackie was sharing with me tonight. Um, she trained another uh, a man actually to be the second pilot and uh, somehow he crashed their only plane. So another guy, Nate Saint, who was a missionary, had collected the parts of the plane and actually rebuilt it. And then he was able to, I think about a year later, start flying it again. But today they have over, I think she said, 120 aircraft. Uh, they've flown over 25,000 people all around the world, uh, missionaries uh, and endeavors. Uh, and as I was thinking about that, she was describing that to me. And I was thinking about Satan, the roaring lion, and all of his dominion that he has in, in uh, villages and towns and cities and major cities all around the world. And yet here's the incredible thing that when the church of Jesus Christ moves in, they bring the badge of the sheriff, Jesus, with them. And they bring the authority and they bring the dominion and they begin to tell the devil himself, you're not in charge here anymore. People that were in darkness, people that were bound to hell, now can put their faith in Jesus, the curse of sin can be broken off of their lives. Fourteen years ago, Jackie and I made the decision to move to Vancouver. It was shortly before Christmas of 2000, would have been the very end of 2008. And uh, we uh, got in our, 
uh, U-Haul and our other vehicles that we drove over. It was quite a trip. It was a snowstorm. Uh, Spokane had five feet drifts, snow drifts. I-84 was so frozen it was shut down. It took us, if I remember correctly, it took us like 25 hours to get here. Normally it would be about an eight or a ten hour drive. And uh, Jackie and I were so wore out. I, I think Jackie didn't ever want to drive again if she could help it at that time. Amen. It was a pretty demanding trip. We get here and we're exhausted. We get through the holidays and uh, we uh, uh, begin to set up, had our first service. And, uh, and, you know, we weren't the first church here, obviously. There's already probably over 200 churches by the time we got here. But you know what? There's people here that were still bound under the darkness of sin that God cares for. Can you say amen? amen. And God is saying... To you and I, as the church of Jesus Christ, there are still more that are under the darkness of Satan. They live. Many of them live fear of death every day. Not just the fear of missing out, but the fear of dying. Because they know that if I die, I don't know where I'm going to go. And yet we have the answer, and that's Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the one who has defeated the roaring lion. You want to defeat the devil, surrender your life to Jesus, grow in the love of Jesus, your relationship with him, and begin to be, build connection to the church of Jesus Christ. There's going to come a time where our world is going to try to shake apart the churches. It's already started, but it's, going to get, it's probably going to get a little, a little wilder, a little crazier. They're going to try to cancel us. They're going to come against us in the courts, I can, I can guarantee you. They're going to do uh, all these different things. You don't, need, you don't need to live in fear of it because you know what? This is Jesus' church. Amen. And I believe we have a short limit of time. And right when it starts, things start getting really bad, I believe. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, Jesus is going to say, okay, it's time. Sound the trumpet. Until that time, church, our mission is to go find those that are under the bondage, just like these lions that were killing and tormenting these people, is to go rescue souls from the grip of the lion's mouth and see them receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I want you to bow your heads tonight. Close your eyes. Nobody moving around, if you would, just for a moment. We're going to pray. In a moment, I believe God's speaking to hearts. First of all... Uh, any that are here, you're unsaved or backslidden, I want to pray for you. You say, you know what, I need to get right with Jesus. If that's you, would you lift up your hand? I see that hand. God bless you. Amen. You can put it down. Thank you for your honesty. I see that hand. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? I need to get right with Jesus. Unsaved or backslidden, the lion has had a grip. Maybe you've even felt it in your mind. It's like you can't think straight. Sin is... You know, you never thought it would get this way, but it's taken over. It's beginning to grip your mind and your heart. <clears throat> the guilt, shame, you can't hardly live with it. Tonight, you can get it right. Anybody else, I need to get right with Jesus. Unsaved or backslidden, quickly lift up your hand. I want to pray for you. God's moving in your heart. Amen. If you lifted your hand, I want you to lift your head and look me in the eye and ask you a question. Did you mean that, sir? I believe he did. Young man here, do you mean that? Yeah, would you come? Would you come? I'll have someone come with you. It's okay, just slip on out. He's going to come and pray with you. Just slip on out. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. As we're uh, just waiting on God here tonight, God's here in this place. Hallelujah. Amen. God's in this place tonight. God bless you, man. Hallelujah. God bless you, man. He's going to pray with you. You can just kneel down right there. Amen. Anyone else? You want to come and pray? I need to get right with Jesus. I want to speak then to the saints of God. God's speaking to hearts. I'm here about decisions. I'm not going to go back and re-preach the sermon. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking already to people. Satan is a defeated foe. But only if you surrender to the Lion of the tribe of Judah. If there's footholds in your life, he's going to look for them. 
access points, decisions, thought process, your thought life. As you can surrender, come and bring those things to Jesus and say, you know what, I'm not going to give the devil a foothold of sin. I'm not going to give him something to work with. I'm going to take dominion. Let's uh, stand. Would you stand with me? This altar's open. Amen. Slip out. Come. Find a place to pray. For he is Lord. Lord. Come talk to God. And for he, he is Lord. Lord, we surrender to you. He is Lord. Hallelujah. Cry out to God this evening. Lord, I surrender. God, I repent. If there's sin, God, I repent of sin right now. Pride. Pride is a killer. It took out even the devil himself. God, I repent of pride, of stubbornness, of self-righteousness, whatever it may be. Hallelujah. Self-pity. Often pride hides behind self-pity as a cloak stubbornness, whatever it may be, fear, hallelujah. Now then, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to live in condemnation for one more day. The blood of Jesus can cleanse you, make you clean, make a decision tonight. I'm choosing to submit my life to Jesus. I'm submitting these areas of my life tonight you find that you're struggling to live for God. Maybe the issue is that there's some footholds there. The enemy's got some strongholds in your mind and in your heart. You've placed other things above him, other people. Hallelujah. Your priorities maybe. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Let him talk to you about your life. Let him help you. Let him help you discern the good from the evil. you to stand with me tonight. We're going to close in a moment. Would you stand with me? I mean, I've had to stand the whole service, so. <clears throat> want us all to stand, if you would, please. Hallelujah. Welcome. That's right. Amen. And that's the story of every sinner that surrenders and repents, gives a life to Jesus. And he receives us, the Father receives us into his kingdom. I want to speak tonight. There's people here that, uh, and that's good. You have to, um, you have to reject the lie, right? 
Because if you don't, you're essentially condoning it and embracing it. And perhaps there's been lies planted. Maybe it's things you don't even realize. But I believe God's spoken to some folks here tonight about some lies. Lies about you. Lies about God. Lies about the church of Jesus. It's amazing how many people, believers I find, believe lies about the church of Jesus. Well, you know, I don't go to church because, you know, I just don't believe in organized religion. You mean you don't believe in the church? Because the church is the body of Christ. How can you not believe in something that Jesus himself said, I will build it? I'm not suggesting that every group that claims to be a church is an actual church or legitimate. I'm not. I understand that. There are some groups that claim to be the church that are definitely not the church. <clears throat> but that's easily solved through the Word of God. The decision is on you. Sometimes we struggle with when it comes to, well, I don't know. I don't know if I really believe that. I'm not going to tell you what to believe. You're a human. You're made in the image of God. You have the ability to reason, to think rationally. It's on you, ultimately. You're going to be the one to stand before God and give an account. But my question to you is, are there any lies that you have embraced? Just like what you said. You said, I'm not going to get a reward in heaven. That's a lie. Okay? The Bible tells us there are rewards given in heaven. And, and I'm not calling you a liar. I'm just saying that we, we have to, yeah, we, we, have to, we have to align ourselves with the Word of God, right? How many lies? What's that song? Lies, lies, tell me sweet little lies. Sometimes we lie to ourselves, don't we? Man, I still got it. Mm, I don't know. I think we need Jesus more than we think. Yeah, just, just let me talk for a minute. Just, just let me talk for a minute, sir. Yeah, you're okay. And so that's that's the issue is that we need to we need to settle the issue. Can you say amen? And we need to renounce the lies and embrace the truth of Jesus. You already have it. You already have the truth of Jesus. Can you say amen? And line up your thoughts with the Word of God. I'd like to pray with, pray with you. There's people. Here, there's lies that have been assaulting your mind, lies about your value, maybe lies about your children, maybe lies about your future, okay? And you've just embraced it because you said, I don't, I don't, this is all I know to be true. And tonight, the Spirit of God is, is challenging you and saying, no, that's not true, and I know it, and you know it. Yeah, and I want to pray with you about it to, uh, to renounce those and to judge those. Amen. Would you lift your hands and pray with me? Would you say these words? Say, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for the blood that you shed at the cross that overcomes the devil. Lord, I thank you for your testimony. I thank you for the word of God that exposes sin, that exposes pride, that exposes the lies. Lord, tonight I renounce these lies. Lies about your love. Lies about your word, lies about your people, and your image bearers. I renounce every lie. I bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Jesus Christ. I take authority and I take dominion over every demon spirit that would resist the will of God. Every fleshly attitude, every work of the flesh, every mindset, every stronghold that resists the will of God, I judge these and I tear them down. The blood of Jesus sets me free. Lord, I embrace you and the truth that you've given me through your word. In Jesus' name, I am set free. Amen. Can we just begin to praise Him and worship Him tonight?
Shidio Rebelo Bokanda Rabalai. One of the benefits of a daily prayer life is that you can get on your knees before God. And you can align your mind and your heart with the will of God. It's not a guarantee. Right? It's not a, not a fix-all for everything. But I tell you, it really does help to get things set straight first thing in the morning. First thing in your day. You know what? I'm going to set this straight. I'm going to get this right. I'm going to start the day with dominion in my mind with God. When you begin to do that. You have a habit of prayer, a habit of getting into the Word of God, a habit of being here. You're here in church tonight. It's a great habit. All of a sudden, you start finding that your mind starts having a lot more dominion. <clears throat> the strangest people are the ones that get off by themselves. Long hours left to themselves. Some of you know what it's like to, uh, you know people that have been in solitary confinement. Maybe some of you have been in solitary confinement yourself. It's not good. You lose your mind. I don't even know the statistics of the numbers, but I can just imagine, even for a few days, not being around people. This is what happens when we isolate. For some of us, you've gotten saved, and God's brought you into the church, and you're forcing yourself to build relationship and begin to get to know. And it's new and it's difficult. It's difficult to become vulnerable. Right? But you know what? Make yourself go through it. To build relationships. Make yourself vulnerable. All right? Now, I'm not saying you need to tell everything to every single person in church, but you begin to build relationships. You surrender your life to God. You get right with headship. Those in authority. And all of a sudden you find... There's a peace and a dominion that comes over your mind. Hallelujah. God's a God of dominion tonight. We can defeat the devil. Yeah, he's a roaring lion. But you know what? Jesus can defang him. Jesus can help you gain the victory over him. It says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Hallelujah. I think about this woman, Betty Green. Jackie was sharing with me that I haven't read this book. I'm going to read it. But she was sharing with me. That's, how I, that's what I do for books. I just have Jackie read it and then tell, give me the synopsis. <laughs> Amen. It's great. It's better, it's better than listening to an audio book. Amen. She can tell me the highlights. And uh, she said this woman would, uh, it was, wasn't uncommon for her to go to places where they had a, bl a br like a field that were, they were intending to use as a landing strip, but they couldn't use it the first time until she had gone in and checked it. So she would land in a nearby city, and sometimes she would walk 35, 40, 50 miles, hike in to these landing strips, and to go and look through these fields and make sure everything was okay and get all the right you know, kind of indicators and things in place. To establish dominion. But you know, that's incredible. That's an incredible thought. Because later, those planes would bring these missionaries and they would land. And as they would get off that plane, they would go. They would begin to establish an outpost. They'd begin to witness. Oh. <laughs> I guess we just needed some mood light. Can you hit it? <laughs> no switches. Amen. And uh, they would establish an outpost. And now as these missionaries would come, they'd begin to witness these people, and these people would be changed by Jesus and go from darkness to light, dominion. That's the kingdom of God. Amen. Roaring lion no longer was going to have a hold on their life. Amen. We're going to close with the word of prayer. And uh, God's so good. Isn't God good tonight? Hallelujah. God's good. He's here and he's helping us. Let's be together. Let's come back. Uh, don't forget for youth crew, that's Friday. And then Saturday we'll have our 
outreach and men's class as well. Let's close with the word of prayer. Reuben, would you ask God to bless us as we go tonight? Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We ask that you would let this word be engraved in every one of our hearts and into our minds, that we would be edified and grow from this yes, word. Yes, Jesus. And we would take this and apply it to our life and all the outgoings in our mind and in our heart. We give you the praise and the glory for the miracle work that you have started, and we give you praise and glory for the miracle work that you still have in store in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you tonight. You love one another this evening.